So hi, hello everyone again. Welcome to another Saturday microscopy live stream. Microbe Hunter here, Oliver. And uh, today um, I plan to do several things. Um, as a matter of fact, not one topic, but a little bit something of a microscopy variety show maybe, um, where I would like to share with you some, yeah, some different aspects and also some of my viewers also uh, volunteer to share some pictures and some videos that I would also like to show you today. I would like to say, of course, a big thank you. Um, I see that uh, again, uh, people started uh, to comment uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, and I would like to say a big hello all around the world. Um, yeah, so it's been a request uh, that uh, I save the live stream uh, yeah, until tomorrow. Well, all of the live streams um, are automatically saved on YouTube and you can always watch them later, of course. Uh, hello from Lebanon, from Vietnam, from Hamburg, from New York, from Turkey, okay, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from Serbia, okay, and sound and video are perfect. Thank you very much. Hello from Greece, uh, from Belgium. Thank you very much for the feedback that the sound is uh, fine. <coughs> because uh, it can happen occasionally that there's some technical issues. And now if uh, for whatever un unexpected reason the live stream is interrupted, then um, I will um, attempt to restart the live stream again, but possibly using a different link because this happened several weeks ago and uh, was a little bit stressful for, for all of us, I guess. Hello from California. Great. Well, um, I'm going to do the following. Uh, I'm going to um, yeah talk about several issues today. I would like to, uh, first of all, complete uh, the thing that I started last week. Last week I forgot to show you the vitamin C slide because last week I uh, prepared some crystals and then when I basically finished the live stream um, I got a last comment uh, reminding me that I should uh, put the vitamin C also under the microscope and now you see here on the side on the side over here that is vitamin C. Um, I'm also going to put some uh, some um, a water plant under the microscope to see the the chloroplasts moving. I've, uh, I received uh, yeah, nine questions uh, per email microscopy related questions but not technical questions um, but so and I think that they are also quite uh, quite nice um, yeah so um, and of course uh, a couple of uh, videos uh, and uh, pictures that were sent to me so but I'm going to pick up first um, yeah uh, but by the way if you're new here of course you're welcome to post the questions in the chat um, and uh, I will attempt to answer them maybe you can put an at sign at micro punter or at Oliver in front so that I'm able to find the questions quickly because there's also some communication going on between uh, yeah, the, the, the in the community itself okay so yes <clears throat> I can already see over here uh, one of the last comments uh, from Marie uh, it looks like peacock feathers yes that's correct and this is the reason why I wanted to show it to you uh, this is something very common in, in vitamin C. Um, I'm just going, you know, it's actually not the best uh, vitamin C slide here, um, but you can see it's in polarized light and uh, those uh, string, the long shapes here, these are just dust. Yeah, it's a little bit dust and dirt and uh, this is basically how it looks like. Um, uh, you need a lot of experimentation here uh, because uh, it depends quite a, a little bit on the concentration of the vitamin C um, and uh, yeah, and on a variety of other variables, how fast it dries, the type of solvent that you use. This was a mix of water and alcohol. And you see that uh, sometimes you see the central part here. Well, that is uh, where the crystallization started. And then it started to crystallize outwards. Yeah, here again, peacock feathers, yeah, some, some uh, dust fibers where crystallization started. Yeah, so this is kind of uh, the way that it looks like. Um, I'm going to show you at, at, on the other edge of the slide. Uh, you see that over here, um, it's already too thick and you don't, don't see anything, it's uh, too dark. So this already shows that if you wanna make uh, crystals of vitamin C, do not use uh, too much um, and make sure that the layer is very thin. Now I'm going to show you now how the slide looks in um, yeah, the, the other slide over here. Let's move the questions out of the way here. Um, this is um, basically the vitamin C slide. So I took some vitamin C powder, dissolved it in a little bit of alcohol and water, spread it all across the slide, and you see how irregular the crystallization is. All of those white parts, these, that's the vitamin C crystal. And the reason is, is that, um, yeah, the alcohol evaporated um, and the remaining water contracted due to capillary action, not capillary action, surface tension. <laughs> that's the thing because of surface tension the, the water droplet contracted and therefore um, it got quite concentrated in certain regions and other regions like over here you do not have anything um, so if you try the crystallization just uh, maybe may spread it apart a little bit so that there is an even uh, layer of, of, of water here 
Yeah. So I just wanted to to uh, show that to simply to complete a little bit the uh, um, the thing from last uh, from last time. And yeah, vitamin C is actually one of the nice uh, and um, I would say a nicer uh, substances. Uh, to produce crystals here yeah, but here again it's a little too dark and too thick so you have to really go to the edge here and on the side yeah and this is basically where it looks a little bit better okay so i just wanted to kind of show this uh, to you simply to complete a little bit last week's um last week's uh, yeah, um, discussion on, um, about crystallization okay so um what else did i plan uh, to do today um, i'm going to now do the following i'm actually going to um yeah I'm actually going to start to show you um, um, a, a couple of very short videos uh, that were made available to me by one of the viewers because I requested last week um, if you want to contribute something. Um, if you can send me some videos, um, then I would like, uh, yeah, I would be very thankful. I would like to share them then with you. And so I got the permission to share the following videos. As a matter of fact, uh, they can also be found uh, um, on YouTube. And I'm going to also show you the link uh, later on. Okay. But I see that uh, in the meantime, people have, uh, more people have joined in. Hello from Tennessee. Okay. What type of alcohol? Yeah, that's a question now. What type of alcohol, um, IPA or ethanol? Um, I just used a regular, uh, regular ethanol. And the reason why I added the ethanol to the vitamin C is it's, um, it doesn't really dissolve well, the vitamin C in ethanol, but it uh, breaks the surface tension and simply the liquid spreads better. Okay, but still, as we can see over here you know, on this slide, um, after the alcohol evaporated, um, it's still the surface tension of the water, of the remaining water, pulled everything together again and still made it love everything a little bit, yeah. Uh, too concentrated in some regions yeah but i added the alcohol um, simply because um, it uh, breaks the surface tension and therefore um, it's easier to spread <clears throat> okay it's too thick uh, can we add light uh, from the top to see it anyway or would the light not get between the lens okay that's an interesting point um, i do not it is possible to add, add a light from the top i cannot do that now because i don't have a flashlight here um, but um, it will not look nice. Um, the reason is, is because we need, I'm using polarized light now and uh, therefore the polarized light for the colors needs to come from the bottom. Okay. And if you kind of shine light on top, it's uh, going to still, still look very white. Okay. So there are no colors. Um, so, yeah, and, but you can't do that if you uh, take a strong, a, a strong flashlight, but it's going to be pretty disappointing. Um, I don't have a flashlight here with me now. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is, is yes, uh, I would like uh, to say thank you for the following contribution. Um, I would like to show you now a very short video, um, which is uh, quite, uh, quite nice. Look at this. Yes, uh, the channel is called Thai Microcosmos. And uh, there is a YouTube channel there and uh, there are a couple of very nice uh, videos there. So again, a big thank you for, um, for sharing uh, those videos here. Um, the videos are, the videos are not long uh, but they're quite nice i'm going yeah so this is basically the development of a snail a freshwater snail so what you see is is you see and i think there is some text here as well um, you see the development um, of a snail yeah so the, there was a cluster of snail eggs um, yeah in, in an aquarium and uh, then uh, yeah the, the snail eggs they developed into a snail and this is uh, kind of how it looks like and i think it's really fascinating i've not seen this myself yet yeah? So, yeah, so there's an embryo here. It's already 50%. You can already see the individual cells here. Yeah, and it goes on. After 48 hours, you can already see that there is a shell developing after two days. Yeah. And after 60 hours, the heartbeats. Look, um, there is uh, yeah, even already a heartbeat starting here. This is in the snail. Looks uh, quite, uh, quite fascinating. And uh, after 72 hours, you can already so start to see that there is a shell developing. I think you can also see the two eyes already. Yeah, the eyes are usually very pigmented because they have to absorb the light. Eyes, mouth and antenna develop, yes. Here is the text. Okay. So, yeah, uh, there's a second snail on the right side as well. Yeah, so, and here, the predators also multiply. What are these predators? Could these be kind of tiny ciliates that we see over there? Yeah. And after 48, 84 hours, yeah, you can already see very clearly a recognizable uh, shape. And of course, uh, the shell is still so transparent that you can even see the heart beating. Yeah. So quite fascinating to, to see the development here. I mean, that is really, um, yeah, um, 
light microscopy as its best. I mean, that's one of the big advantages of a light microscope. You can see colors, you can see movement, you can actually see the processes of life. Yeah. Electron microscopes have other um, advantages, um, of course, but you cannot see moving objects in electron microscopes. Yeah. In 108 hours you have a, yeah. You see already more and more details starting to develop. Okay. Very fascinating. I was really happy when I got that. Um, it's a four minute video. Um, and if you want to uh, yeah, look at hatching, okay. So I would like to uh, yeah, uh, kindly request, uh, yeah, maybe you can visit uh, the, the YouTube channel of Time Microcosmos and, and maybe also subscribe to it. Let's support, let's support each other a little bit here. Look, it's hatching. You can also already see the foot, uh, yeah, yeah, sticking on the on the microscope slide. The snails, what they have is, is they have a, a mouth like, uh, with uh, some some kind of a, you, know, you you wouldn't call them teeth really. It's called the radula, where they start to start to scrape off the surface. That's why in in an aquarium, also used to have an aquarium, um, you have snails because they clean away the algae that starts to grow on 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 the glass of, of the aquarium. And um, after a couple of days, already moving around. Uh, very nice uh, to see that uh, the snail is still very transparent. Okay, that's the mouth. Ah, that's the right. Yeah, maybe you can. Ah, you can. Can you see those like, tiny little teeth? Right. Yeah, so they, it kind of scrapes the surface of, of, of the microscope slide, um, and this is how it kind of um, yeah harvests uh, algae and other bacteria biofilms, for example, that are growing there. Really nice to see. Yeah, so, um, yes, uh, if you just joined in, this is a video from Thai Microcosmos. I got the permission to show it and please do have a look at, at, um, at the YouTube channel and also subscribe to it. Yeah, here, close up of the heart beating. Yeah, yeah and here again the snail. Yeah. So highly uh, recommended. And I also would like to, yeah, that's uh, it starts to loop here. That's again the channel name. So I would like to show you a second video, okay, here. Um, and these uh, are the contractile vacuoles in phase contrast. Uh, contractile vacuoles, these are the cell, you can read this yourself as well. Um, they found in paramecia and also other ciliates. And what they do is they pump water out of the cell. Yeah, And uh, especially under phase contrast microscopy, um, you can see this really well. I've also observed them already before, but I have to tell you, <laughs> not in that same quality that we have over here. And what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to now use an arrow to narrate this a little bit. Ah, I have to move the arrow, I have to move the arrow upward. Okay, so here we go. Here we go, okay. Um, so what you have over here is, uh, look at these structures here with those white uh, radiating structures uh, and over here as well. And uh, this, uh, these are the so-called, that's a contractile vacuole. Well, you also have one um, over here as well. And you can see how it's actually pumping and moving and, and pulsing. And, and uh, this is, as it contracts, it pumps water out of the, uh, of the cell. So this is a, a single cell, it's a ciliate paramecium. Okay, um, you have see other cell organelles in here somewhere, the nucleus, I think this one over here is the mouth of the paramecium. Um, it could be some food vacuoles. Um, it's green, so probably the cell has eaten some algae. Okay, um, but we have now a look at those uh, yeah, contractile vacuoles over there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's continue to, to look at this. Um, I have to play the video, okay. You can actually see how it, see how it changes the shape, yeah? And it's, it's like a pump. Yeah, uh, pumping, collecting water from inside the cell and, and pumping it outwards. Yeah. The, the interplay between the radiating canals and contractile vacuole is a, as beautiful um, as it is critical. The following is slowed down to half speed. Yeah. On the surface, you can also see the tiny little hair beating. Uh, these are the cilia. Yeah. And uh, phase contrast microscopy um, is uh, of course uh, of a big advantage here because it allows you to see structures that are otherwise transparent so phase contrast microscopy converts differences in refractive index of this uh, different parts of, of a specimen into brightness differences um, so this actually was awarded the nobel prize back in the day yeah. and fritz zernicke yeah he he invented this and he got uh, he got the nobel prize okay so now it's it's looping the video is looping and, and uh, while it is looping i'm going to go over there again to the chat section
Okay. Um, yeah, there are uh, no uh, questions here, but yes, a new patron. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so this is quite nice, and I would like to show you another one. This is actually was some people. Sometimes people ask me what is my favorite <laughs> microbe. I think this one is quite, quite fun to watch. It's Lacrimaria. It's a single-celled uh, uh, ciliate as, as well. It has this long, extensible neck with uh, which it's able to hunt. But look what happens. Yeah. So this one is now hunting. Yeah. But in just a second, look. There's another one, and it just basically hit the first one. And really, look. Yeah, and it's uh, going to eat it up now. Yeah, so it really uh, attacked the other one, and uh, yeah, the other one died. Okay, but look what happens now. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, eating it up. It's swallowing it up. It's sucking it in. Yeah, so it's cannibalism <laughs> on a microscopic scale. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Look at this. How 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 flexible it is. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> that was the meal. Yeah, one of them eating the other one. Yeah, a again, if if you wanna uh, watch those, please visit uh, visit uh, the channel Thai Microcosmos. Yeah, it's it's really great to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a, a question here. Lacrimaria can be cannibalistic, and I say why not? Um, this uh, does not surprise me because many microorganisms, even microscopic animals, uh, sometimes are cannibalistic. They'll eat whatever goes in their way. Um, even water bears, <laughs> some of them, uh, as cute as they might look, um, some of them are cannibalistic as well. Yeah, so they're not really selective here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'm just reading again some of the comments here. Um, there's a question about this Swift uh, 380T. Okay. Um, yeah. There's a light issue here. Um, yeah. So let's. Uh, I would like to show you now the next thing here, and this is now the the website or the the uh, the YouTube channel. Okay. So please, uh, why not as, as a little thank you? Maybe you can visit the, the web uh, web page uh, and also the the YouTube channel and uh, and subscribe to it. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the contributions. And uh, if you um, also would like uh, me to share something with the community, then please uh, do send me a link uh, or videos or pictures. I do have a few more pictures as well that I would like to show. Yeah, And uh, yeah, then I think uh, we can get the community also a little bit involved. So I do have a few more things, uh, but what I would like to do um, a little bit is, is uh, for those of you who were not here last uh, week, very quickly, I would like to show you um, yeah, and uh, because I also made some videos, uh, but still, because it was kind of interesting, I would like to show you again the crystals in soy sauce, which looked kind of, uh, this was actually based on the recommendation of one of my viewers. He says, can you put soy sauce under the microscope? And I, I did that. And I was really surprised that if you wait for the soy sauce to, to dry, yeah, then it makes those beautiful crystals in, in polarized light. Yeah. So just for those of you who maybe were not here last week, this is uh, something that I've done last week. And also in the channel, uh, this channel, I have a few YouTube videos, also YouTube shorts, where I show you how I've done that. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is basically, you can see that the, the crystals here, they kind of uh, survived reasonably well. So um, I've made it simply by putting a little bit of soy sauce on the microscope slide, no cover glass, and uh, simply wait uh, for it uh, for it to dry. Okay. So um, what else do I have today? Yes, um, I went out and I bought something that I would like to show you. And I'm going to put this also under the microscope. Look at this. Okay. You probably know what this is. Let me get some tissue paper. It's all wet. I bought this uh, from an aquarium shop for about two euros. Um, the, this is a water plant uh, and the name of the water plant is called Igeria densa. I've got somewhere I put the little, uh, how do you say, the tag and I misplaced it of course. No, it's here. Um, let me quickly get that. It was a tag with a name included. Igeria densa is the name. It's a, um, also a, a, some a very related one is called Ilodia or Ilodia densa. And here it is. Okay. And this is a water plant which grows extremely quickly. Um, generally, uh, yeah, if you have fast growing water plants inside an aquarium, 
then this reduces uh, the nutrients uh, of the dissolved nutrients in the water and this also reduces algae growth. Um, so those rapidly growing uh, plants um, sometimes are pretty useful. And uh, why I like those is, is because uh, they make an excellent specimen for microscopy um, to observe how plant cells look like because the chloroplasts can be seen very nicely. Uh, the, uh, this uh, plant uh, is, has very thin leaves, okay? Um, and uh, therefore it's possible to put it directly under the microscope without the need of cutting it or microtoming it. And this has the big advantage that I'm not damaging the cells and therefore I can observe the processes of life much better. Uh, normally if you take um, other yeah, terrestrial plants, they have uh, sometimes very thick leaves. Um, and uh, of course they have to be also thick and uh, they have a, a, a waxy cuticle on, on top and as well sometimes very thick and, and, and dense because um, you, the plants want to prevent water loss. This is of course not a problem here with those water plants. And uh, yeah, the leaves are really nice uh, to observe. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you now some of the moving chloroplasts uh, that you have here. Um, because, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so um, this one, uh, Elodia, or uh, this one, um, Elodia densa, or this one specifically is called Igeria densa, uh, two, yeah, I think highly related plants. Um, and uh, in German, uh, it's called Was Wasserpest. <laughs> uh, basically water pestilence <laughs> it's a, a, a pest a water pest it's called because it grows so rapidly that it actually can be a problem in, in some places and all I'm doing is is uh, pretty pretty easy I'm, I'm taking out one of those and I'm simply ripping off a, a leaf here as it is and, and then I put it directly on the microscope slide with a small drop of water that's that's pretty much oh you cannot see that yeah I'm just going to add a little bit of drop of water like this yeah. Ah, no, it sticks on my finger. Okay. Um, and um, a cover glass. And I also have to tell you that I, yes, I did uh, prepare also a time lapse of this. Okay. Um, but this is a standard, um, yeah, a standard specimen that's also used in education quite often to illustrate uh, the functioning of cells and to illustrate some characteristics of plant cells. And also, <laughs> I also sometimes do that. You want to give students in school something interesting to observe um, under the microscope. Okay, so this is uh, yeah something that. So let's put that on here. And I think there is enough water on here, so everything's properly submerged in water. Let's remove any excess here. I do not want to flood my microscope. And then everything goes under the microscope. Let me have a look. So let's take out the vitamin C. And let's have a look at uh, the, the cells of this water plant. Now, at, uh, yeah, at this low magnification, it really doesn't look very, very interesting. Okay, um, of course, we can see the individual cells, you, you can see it's green and maybe some of you have already noticed there are not only cells of the Igeria on here, but there are a couple of other cells as well. Have you already, have you found the diatoms? <laughs> yeah, diatoms are algae and uh, they can be seen. Yeah, look at these, yeah, there are diatoms here, here, yeah, maybe here as well. Yeah, and uh, yeah, some other algae over here. So um, yeah. Evidently they are growing um, also on this water plant, but when you go up with the magnification, yeah, then we are able to see already those tiny green dots, which are the chloroplasts. And these chloroplasts are, I think, very fascinating for several reasons, okay? Ah, somebody loves diatoms here. Ah, let's have then a closer look at some of those diatoms. Um, you have to refocus a little bit because of course, as they're growing on the surface of the leaf, their level of focus is different. So for those of you, oh, I bumped again into it. I lost the focus again. Yeah, I, I, I bumped into, uh, because I have to bend over a little bit. Yeah, now here we go again. So, yeah. so I'm just gonna uh, use my arrow again for those of you who don't recognize those. These here are diatoms here, here as well. Diatoms, they have a silica shell, yeah, so, and they look quite nice as well. So I always go up with the light a little bit here. But actually it's not the diatoms that I want to show you. 
but the diatoms and the cells of the plant have something similar. Look carefully, if you look here, um, the diatoms also have those green areas, the dark green, well, these are also chloroplasts, of course, and they do photosynthesis. Okay, but the chloroplasts in Elodia or Egeria, I think, are significantly more interesting. Okay, so I'm going to find a nice place somewhere where it's not too dense. Let's have a look at those cells over here. And let's go up with the magnification to 60 times. Okay, let's go up here again and uh, refocus. Okay, so let's make the arrow disappear again. And um, yeah, you can now see the individual chloroplasts, those round uh, circles. And um, yeah, depending a little bit on the region of the leaf, you are actually able to see that they move. They should be moving. They don't always move very quickly, but they do move. Okay, and uh, I've seen that uh, the movement is not always the same everywhere on the leaf. So sometimes you have to look around a little bit and sometimes in some areas uh, they move more than in other areas okay okay so that is um, yeah also not so much movement here and they do move but kind of slowly yeah so let's have a look here maybe yeah. So if this, for whatever reason, if they don't move, then uh, yeah, you just, just have to be a little bit patient. So there is also a comment. Uh, it seems that like the size of the Elodia chloroplast and the size of the diatom uh, chloroplast are not the same. That is correct, and they don't have to be the same. If you, for example, the, uh, the size of the chloroplast can differ vastly. Um, for example, if you look at the chloroplasts of uh, the algae spiro spiro spirogyra, spirogyra, it has a spiral-shaped chloroplast, yeah, a yeah, pretty, pretty large one even. Yeah? So um, the size itself is uh, not surprising that it's not the same. Yeah? Yeah, here they are moving, ah, not, not very much, I have to tell you. I've seen um, regions already before where movement was a little bit um, yeah, more. And uh, there are now some people who've joined in. Um, and the question here is, 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 at what are we looking tonight? Yeah, and for those of you who just joined in, uh, today's uh, live stream is going to be a little bit of a, yeah, a little bit of everything, so to say. <laughs> Not one specific topic, but I simply want to show you different things here. Um, I uh, want to show you, um, um, yeah, right now some this water plant with a chloroplast under the microscope um, at the beginning uh, of the stream i showed you some vitamin c from last week and uh, today i would like to show you a couple of more pictures and then maybe yeah i've got over here a tiny little insect that i found and i put it into alcohol maybe i'm going to make a permanent mount of this as well yeah. so yeah so this is kind of the thing and what you do is is when you focus uh, through the the specimen now and you're able to see that there are actually two there should be two cell layers at least i'm able to identify two cell layers and you can see that um, by looking um, at the cell wall again i'm going to uh, show you that with an arrow uh, you see of course the very dark lines here that's uh, basically uh, these are the cell walls but there are also some thin lines here okay and this seems to be overlapping so this seems to be like a second layer of cells and you can also see that uh, when a focus, then as one goes into focus, the other one goes out of focus, which indeed in, uh, shows that uh, they are on top of each other, right? See, yeah. You see, there are basically yeah, two different cells, seem to be two different cell layers. Mm -hmm. So that is a little bit also um, one possibility how you can estimate how thick a specimen is. Is this by, by simply uh, going from one uh, side uh, in focus all the way to the other side in focus and then seeing how far you have turned to find focus knob. Um, and this gives you an estimate of, of the thickness of, um, of the specimen. Yeah, yeah so um, of course the movement of the chloroplast is due to cytoplasmic streaming as uh, is already mentioned over here. Um, so um, let's have a look. Um, why do spirogyra, why do they have spiral chloroplasts? 
Um, that's a difficult question. Um, you might as well ask why do these here have round chloroplasts um, or why do um, yeah, many plants have different uh, uh, forms of chloroplast and um, if I give you uh, I, I might I'm going to give you now the, the answer and you might not be very happy with it um, because it works. Um, yeah, you have to always uh, you have to understand that there are sometimes multiple ways how a problem can be solved. And uh, essentially, the way that uh, the Sparogyra has chloroplasts uh, are arranged, uh, it works well for that species. And uh, here the chloroplasts are different and it works well for that. Uh, but uh, the job is always done. And uh, therefore, um, yeah, sometimes um, I have to go back now long time <laughs> back to my university studies when we did a course in evolutionary biology. Um, yeah, the professor, I remember exactly what the professor said is because we students also used to ask those questions. What's the purpose of this and what's the purpose of that? And uh, the, or what's the advantage of this? Um, so if you're asking why does uh, Sparogyra have uh, spiral chloroplasts, you could reformulate that and you could say is what is the evolutionary advantage of having spiral chloroplasts? And the professor told us that sometimes in nature, not everything has an advantage. Sometimes things are just the way they are. Um, and because uh, they, there is no disadvantage, therefore, um, yeah, the organism survived. Yeah? Um, if it were a disadvantage, then it would have died out, right? Um, but sometimes there is no advantage. It's simply neutral and it also works. Yeah? So this is um, a little bit the answer that I have to give you here. And I know that this is maybe not entirely satisfactory. Okay. Um, yeah, so this looks uh, much more familiar to me, Oliver. Last week with all those polarization filters, I felt like watching um, <laughs> SF stuff. SF supposedly means science fiction. <laughs> yes. Um, is the cytoplasmic streamlink from the plant the same as Brownian motion? Definitely not. Very good question. Um, so there is a, a Marcel was asked, is asking, is cytoplasmic streaming the same as Brownian motion? Uh, Brownian motion is random movement of the particles due to temperature. But cytoplasmic streamlining is a highly directed movement, as I'm going to show you. And it is because um, there are, this is so-called the cytoskeleton inside the cells, which are uh, protein filaments, actin and myosin, sliding against each other. You might remember that uh, for some of you that you can find the same proteins also in muscles. Right in animals, but uh, those uh, um, those uh, uh, protein fibers cause uh, the cytoplasm to um, yeah to stream, and the chloroplasts are pulled along. Um, there is, if you do some research, why does this happen? Um, it's, it's said it was well, this ha ha some can be used to reposition the chloroplasts to get optimum light. Yeah, this is one possibility. But then, yeah, other plants don't do that to that extent, and it also works. But you can now see that there is indeed a little bit of slow movement going on. And uh, to um, add a little bit more excitement here, to add a little bit more excitement here, I'm going to show you now the video that I made. Okay, let me turn off the arrow and look at the video. So this is a time lapse video 10 times faster, which I made today in the afternoon. Okay, look at this. Yeah. Same, same plant. I um, did make it a little bit brighter. Yeah. So this is uh, 10 times the speed. And I think it looks really cool. And uh, um, if you follow them along, then you can see that they actually, yeah, here example. Yeah. Look, this is uh, uh, circling. So this is not random. Brownian motion is, is random, but this is not random. And uh, it's a central vacuole. And, and so in the cytoplasm, basically the, the, the chloroplasts are, are pulled along. Yeah. So this is, uh, I think, uh, quite quite a nice thing. I just made this uh, today, a couple of hours ago, yeah. it's for maybe about ten minutes long or so. Yeah, here, uh, here, I have to move this over now. Just a second. I'm going to move the video over because what you see over here is, um, yeah, is an air bubble. And look what happens to the air bubble. No, not air bubble. I'm lying. Oxygen bubble. Yeah, this bubble here grows because the chloroplasts doing photosynthesis, they start to produce oxygen. Yeah. And this oxygen bubble is, is growing. So and we're starting back again at the beginning. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, are chloroplasts endosymbiotic in a similar manner to mitochondria or just cell organelles? Well, <laughs> they're both. <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, um, yes. Uh, long story. Um, 
essentially the chloroplasts um, once were, um, and there is a strong genetic evidence for this, uh, and also um, uh, cellular evidence, the chloroplasts uh, during the evolution of, of cells were once separate cells. They were bacteria, prokaryotes, um, genetically highly related to the cyanobacteria, the so-called blue-green algae, as they were once called. And they moved into a host cell, by the way, also the mitochondrion, and they established themselves in there and now became cell organelles. Um, so a cell organelle is, is a structure inside a cell. It's a rather generic term. Um, now, in most cases, uh, those chloroplasts um, have become very dependent on the host cell. So you cannot remove them from the host cell um, and they're not able to survive. Um, also, our mitochondria that we have, uh, they are actually related to the so-called proteobacteria. Um, and the mitochondria alone are not able to survive. However, there are some algae out there that have chloroplasts, which still are able to survive on their own. Okay, so it's kind of fascinating. Yeah? Um, so in nature, um, you actually find this as well, that, um, for example, in uh, Paramecium buzeria, single-celled uh, protist, also has endosymbiontic algae from the uh, uh, species chlorella. Yeah, so they've kind of eaten them up and, and uh, are able to live in there. So the answer is, is it depends. Uh, sometimes those uh, chloroplasts um, are highly dependent and have actually become part of the cell. Um, in other cases, uh, yeah, they are still able to survive on their own. Yeah. So this is, uh, is uh, quite a fascinating thing. Yeah. Um, so um, chloroplast and chloroplast, which discovery was named first? I don't know that. I mean, hmm. uh, concerning, concern, uh, I think chloro means color or green. Yeah. And plastids, um, I don't know about the entomology of the, the original source. Yeah? Do you calibrate or do the maintenance of your own optical microscopes? If so, how? Thank you. I will tell you the following. Um, the microscope that I have over here, um, I'm not going to do any maintenance on this uh, myself. It's uh, simply yeah, too valuable for me. Uh, but uh, for the low-cost microscopes, if there is basic maintenance to do, then of course I will do that myself. I once tried fixing an, uh, a microscope uh, by re lubricating it and I have failed miserably because I did not have the tools, uh, the appropriate tools, um, and um, also the ball bearing system of the mechanical stage was extremely difficult to repair. There are tiny balls in the mechanical stage and they fell out and I could not get them back. <laughs> it was, yeah. Uh, and uh, then I downloaded the, the maintenance manual and the maintenance manual itself was with all of the technical drawings were so complex. So I'm, I'm kind of a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was a little bit put off by repairing, but it, basic maintenance can be made, uh, done. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of questions over here, uh, but I don't know if they're directed to me or not. Uh, about Z stacking and deconvolution in dark field, also converting one of your uh, stages uh, to motorized. Okay, I can uh, do about the following. Um, the question is, is um, would it be meaningful to convert uh, this uh, microscope uh, to somehow to a motorized stage where it can push some buttons and then do the focusing and the movement um, and everything? Actually, I did consider that. Um, and for one of my microscopes, my older microscopes, I actually attempted to 3D print uh, something with stepper motors and so on. But this also was highly experimental and didn't work well. So I did consider this. Um, um, and uh, the reason why I considered uh, using some kind of a, a motorized drive for the microscope is because when I do live streams like this, it's a little bit easier. Okay, then um, I just have, can push some buttons and I don't have to reach over. Yeah. So this is a, yeah. Um, can you explain why some of the chloroplasts are moving in a circle? Um, you mentioned something about a central vacuole. Yes, plant cells um, often have a, a central vacuole or at least a large vacuole and uh, the cytoplasm is around it. And therefore, um, when the cytoplasm is moving, they're kind of like over here, they're circling around the central vacuole. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah, uh, indeed a possibility here. So what I'm going to do now... Um, um, yeah, maybe I'm going to take the next question as well. Um, so the cell must split to have some chloroplasts inside them. I take it uh, Elodia is life dependent on those chloroplasts. Uh, sure. 
because they are now an essential part uh, for photosynthesis. Otherwise, the plant is not able to survive. I guess the question relates to that. If uh, the cell splits and divides, um, is it necessary that both of these cells have uh, their chloroplasts? Yes, because what happens is that those chloroplasts inside the cell will also divide. Yes, it's kind of uh, interesting to see that they kind of, they too have DNA, chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own DNA even. It's also one of the evidences that this, these were indeed, indeed separate, uh, separate organisms, separate bacteria a long time ago. Um, yeah, and, but indeed if a cell divides, then uh, both the daughter cells have to have um, yeah, chloroplasts and, and mitochondria. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is now the following is I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, pick up a couple of questions that I got here. Um, as well, because some of the questions uh, are not directly technical in nature. So I kind of found them also quite interesting because it's a little bit also look behind the scenes. And I'm just going to yeah, kind of uh, show them to you here. I mean, these are nine questions. It's kind of long, um, but maybe I'm not going to spend too much time in answering them in detail. But I would do it. Um, but I thought maybe some of you are also interested. Okay. The question is, what prevents you from uploading a greater variety of things under the microscope? And uh, indeed, I will tell you a little bit of what some of my issues or problems are. And you know what, while I'm talking, I'm just going to turn on the chloroplast again. And the thing is, is if I want to put something under the microscope, it's got to look a little bit nice. There are so many specimens uh, that I found and I put them under the microscope and I discover ah, they don't look nice enough. Yeah. So, um, so I know it might be interesting, but uh, there's got to be some movement. There's got to be some color, right? Um, otherwise, people don't watch it so much. And yeah, that's a little bit one of the things. Um, how does your family feel about the hobby of microscopy? Well, yeah, I think my kids are quite interested as well. They're also watching this live stream here. Um, but uh, I would say it does take a little bit of space. And uh, I do need a fairly large table and a room. Um, so in that sense, it does impact a little bit uh, yeah, on, on, on the available <laughs> size of the apartment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you currently pursue this YouTube channel in part motivated by monetary gains? I mean, I'm always happy when um, people support the channel, for example, by shopping something over the affiliate links and so on, because uh, the money that I make this way, which is not a lot, but still better than nothing, um, I use also to buy microscopy equipment uh, to do some reviews and so on. Yeah. So I kind of try to feed this back a little bit into, um, into, the, um, into the YouTube channel as well. Yeah. Would your definition of the hobby include speaking into the camera? So that's another thing. Is this basically, is microscopy the only thing? Or is also making videos a part of this? And I think ever since I started making YouTube videos, um, I think I took the hobby, hobby more seriously. Um, I'm now a little bit more challenged. What am I going to put under the microscope today? Which videos am I going to make? And uh, for this reason, I can recommend uh, to actually start a YouTube channel uh, or I don't know, an online picture album or whatever, uh, simply to document the things that you find because it kind of uh, has a positive feedback also on the hobby. Um, and then there's a community there and uh, otherwise you're all alone, you know. And uh, this is actually something that I consider more important here is, is that uh, I'm able to, um, yeah, um, have a little community and also share my own interests with other people. Yeah. So, yeah, number five. Yeah, which category of things were you most eager to look at when you first obtained a personal microscope? Honestly, I simply put pretty much everything under the microscope that I could find, nothing specific. Um, yeah, but I think uh, I really start lots of water life, of course, yeah, uh, but very unsystematic, right? Um, but it was only much later that I actually started to, when I started to make YouTube videos, it was only then that I started to, to diversify a little bit. So this one is uh, one that I actually want to demonstrate here. Is it helpful to look at the slide with nothing on it before placing the sample, depending on what it is? So the question is, is um, should you check the slide before you actually put a sample on here? I'm going to show you some of the fresh slides that I have here. And I'm going to see that these are blank slides. Okay, let's put this away here again. I'm going to show you a blank slide now. A, a new one. Okay, let's uh, have a look. Uh, it's a little, unfortunately a little bit, you know, I have to refocus again. That's really difficult, but the problem is, let me quickly have a look here. The problem is that, 
here that's the edge the problem is that it's difficult to find here we go so this is now a blank slide and what do you see what do you see it's incredibly dirty it's good yeah so here we go and uh, I found it also difficult. I don't know what this is, uh, but there are indeed some slides out there that are incredibly dirty. Um, from I don't even, what is this line here even? Yeah, from the manufacturing process. Uh, sometimes, um, yeah, I sometimes also clean my slides. Uh, then usually they're cleaner than they were before, but there can of course be some small residues uh, also from the previous microscopy session here. But this one over here. Um, has all of the dirt on the slide even there where I did not put a specimen on it. So all of those circles that you see, maybe I'm going to make this a little bit more contrasty. Uh, it's difficult here, okay? It's too dark. Um, maybe you're able to see that. Yeah, it was on the slide already before and I think this is, yeah, especially if you're looking at bacteria and other difficult objects, this dirt can really distract. Maybe not so much when you're looking at large objects like the, the, the plant cell and so on. Yeah. But look at the scratches on here. I have no idea what this is. Yeah. So um, to, answer, to answer your question, sometimes, it, it, especially if you want to make good videos or pictures, or if, you, or if you're looking at delicate objects, um, it, it, it's not a bad idea to, to have a look at, uh, at a blank slide as well, simply for quality control, um, so that you know whether you should clean it or not. Yeah. So this is uh, really something that I wanted to, to tell you here. Yeah. Um, interesting question here. Would you consider in the not so distant future returning to the academic environment, getting a PhD degree and teaching at a university? I think you would be an amazing macroscopy university teacher. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I have a master's degree in microbiology and then I switched over um, into teaching teaching uh, adolescents um, and um, I wanted to get a PhD originally um, after university but then decided not to and uh, I'm not going to go back to university and I'm not going to get a PhD degree um, however I have to say that uh, every now and then yeah uh, there is you see once if you have already worked in research a little bit and if you've already worked in a laboratory environment and if you had your own projects to work on and you made your own discoveries and so on Ah, once you've experienced this, this is really something, uh, yeah. And uh, I have to admit, admit that occasionally, yes, I do miss that. I do miss that. However, then on the other hand, there are so many downsides in working in research. Yeah? It's uh, an insecure job sometimes, um, very frustrating um, when the experiments don't work. Yeah. Um, so there is always an up and a downside. And what I've decided for myself right now is, is I'm going to um, focus... Um, yeah, on, on education and I consider also YouTube channels like this, this year like an educational channel um, because this kind of uh, fulfills this desire, this part of this desire of doing some practical stuff. Yeah, but uh, no, I won't uh, go back uh, to um, academia, um, at least not to get a PhD where somebody offers me some <laughs> courses to teach uh, in, in molecular microbiology. Um, I think I don't have the time to do that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, so that is a little bit the thing here. So um, I would like to, um, yeah, so that's basically the whole issue with the dirty slides. Okay, um, does is the specimen look different if the room is well lit? So does the, the specimen look different if the room is well lit or when it's dark? I will tell you, if you're using a compound microscope like I have over here, um, it does not make a difference whether you have uh, much light or not. There is a small condition, okay? The reason why it does not make a huge difference is, is because the light from the bottom is so much stronger than any ambient light. However, um, yes, if you really want to push, squeeze out the last uh, a bit of, of image quality, then if you take pictures, then cover the eyepieces of the microscope. Because yes, it is indeed possible for light to go into the eyepieces and this reduces the contrast a little bit. It depends. Yeah, but um, especially with stereo microscopes, I found out that um, there um, the effect is much larger. Um, so sometimes covering the eyepieces um, um, actually does improve the contrast a little bit because usually when you take a picture um, through a microscope, then you usually look at the monitor and you're not looking behind, uh, you're not covering the eyepieces with your own eyes, 
right? Um, so um, that's the thing. And if you're looking yourself through the, the microscope, then you're kind of uh, not allowing any light in through the eyepieces. Um, so this is uh, simply some, some a short recommendation that I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, put it like this. Um, are there or is there a microscope salon anywhere in the world that lets people, uh, you, uh, average people to use the microscopes? Um, not, that I, not that I know of, of course, there are some kind of microscopical societies, but for research, very often, um, honestly, the, sometimes the microscopes are very specific that you need. Yeah, um, And uh, I can imagine that um, this might not always be uh, very practical, that you have to go somewhere to do actually the research. Yeah. So, uh, but I do know that uh, some I've been in some museums, uh, natural history museums, where they had some microscopes set up for people to to use, um, but not so much for research. And uh, I don't think that this would be very practical. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, yeah, the question here. Is there a class that one could attend uh, to learn the basics? Um, again, you'd have to check your local community, uh, but I would say that microscopy as such is not so difficult. Um, and I would suggest that um, if you watch YouTube videos, there's so many tutorials online. Yeah, So that uh, essentially should not be a problem here. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do now is the following. This is another thing I wanted to show you now because I got a few pictures. Let me check the time, it's 50 minutes. Um, I would like to show you um, a couple of pictures here um, that were shared with me as well. It's also quite interesting. We had a little email conversation here. And um, yeah, this is uh, the next thing. I got some pictures sent here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful plants here. And um, look at this, I'm going to show you two pictures of this plant. And then you want to talk a little bit about this as well. Look at this, because we were talking about crystals, so-called idioblasts. Um, so these, the lily the, the, or lotus yeah, plants, when you cut them, then you will see that there are these interesting structures and they're not on the surface. They're called, yeah, they're not on the surface, but they're inside. So inside the plant, yeah, inside these plants over here, um, are those interesting uh, structures here and you see tiny crystals of oxa oxalic acid so these crystals that you see in here let me show this to you again yeah these are let me move the arrow okay yeah these uh, are crystals of oxalic acid the, uh, the function is not entirely known but they assume that this is simply an end product that is stored here yeah and uh, yeah it's quite uh, quite nice to see that, uh, of course, all the plants are able to form those crystals here. I want to show you another one. Yeah, so um, here's another one. Yeah, so this is a, a very nice uh, cut here that was sent to me uh, by a microscopy friend from Germany. We had uh, some a couple of telephone calls where he explained everything to me, and I found it quite nice here um, as well to see those beautiful yeah um, crystals. So a big thank you uh, for sending me the pictures. Yeah. So if you also have uh, pictures to share. Uh, please uh, do send them to me with a lengthy description. Um, yeah, I did not know initially what it was. Um, so I thought actually this was some kind of uh, some plant here on, on the surface of a plant, like uh, the so-called the trichomes. But actually these uh, structures are inside, um, inside the the, um, uh, the plant. Yeah? Um, so they're basically these uh, um, hollow spaces where you have those uh, structures uh, pointing inwards and they store um, the, these crystals uh, of uh, oxalic acid. Yeah? So this is uh, something that I also wanted to to sh uh, show you because I think it's, it's just a nice it's just a nice picture here. Yeah. yeah. So what is the function of this oxalate in, in plants? Um, it is um, is if I darkly remember, um, some animals don't like to eat that. Um, I think it's also found in onions. Um, yeah, in the skin of an onion. But what they assume is, um, or is assumed, this is that it uh, performs no specific function, but that it might be simply an end product of, of metabolism and that it is simply stored away there on a safe place because maybe a too high of a concentration of this um, 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 oxalate, uh, um, um, oxal, um, oxal, oxalic acid <laughs> um, uh, might actually harm uh, metabolism. So it's assumed that the uh, or that's one possibility that it's simply stored away there. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, but simply wanted to show this to you as well. So, yeah, here, these are again the two pictures. 
So I got some other pictures. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you have uh, been in the live stream already for several months. No, or maybe you might remember that a few months back, uh, people sent me pictures of their laboratory workplaces. And I received, uh, yes, uh, again, a few pictures here. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, including um, yeah, a description is a mini a workplace. Yeah, uh, which also shows that uh, microscopy sometimes does not need a lot of space. Yeah. It says here, if required, the head can easily be lifted off and the polarizing filter can be placed in a designated space. Okay, so it's also for polarization microscopy. So it's a microscope desk with a Brunel compound binocular microscope. The objective lens is four times, uh, 10 times, 20 times, and 40 times. And you, you see, uh, you actually notice something here uh, that um, all of the objectives or many of them are of a different, uh, from a different brand. So yeah, you can do that, uh, but this already requires a little bit of experience um, because when you change magnification, um, then it, you might lose uh, the focus a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so these are nice things. Uh, three drawers to keep other important microscopy equipment in, such as spare objective lenses and eyepieces. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah, quite a, a nice one. And there is another one over here. Of course, a whole bunch of laboratory equipment as well. Um, yeah, this looks a little bit, uh, um, a little bit similar to my workplace. Um, and uh, I also keep my uh, all of my chemicals and liquids and everything yeah, in uh, locked away in a yeah, in a cupboard. Yeah, um, but. Uh, yeah, it depends a little bit of what your interests are. If uh, your interests are making permanent slides, and of course it will look d different. And if you're mostly interested in observing, maybe you're making water samples or hi or, or histological microtome cuts. Yeah, so depending a little bit of what your interests are, yeah, or maybe sometimes you don't even need any. If you're just uh, any equipment, you're just looking at permanent slides. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yes, uh, exactly. Ba uh, plant defense. Yes, so it basically because some some animals don't like to eat it then, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So this is uh, simply some some uh, yeah thing and uh, something that I'm also going to experiment around with. I decided I would like to show you now also uh, something else here. Yeah. Thank you again for sending me those pictures, um, and that is a so-called a micrometer. And uh, this is a precision measuring device. Why? Uh, because uh, it measures up to the precision of a one, one thousandth of a millimeter, which is basically the size of a bacterium. That's the precision. That's highly precise. Now, why would you uh, need that? Yes, because uh, this is basically the diameter of the cover glasses. Yeah. So um, the cover glasses, they let me, yeah, let me also show it to you here. Yeah. So it was uh, essentially yeah, uh, used the micrometer to measure the thickness of the cover glasses. I would like to talk a little bit about that um, as well, uh, because cover glass thickness is important for is important for 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 resolution. Yeah? So I would like to show you something here again on the desk. Okay, so the cover glasses that you have here. Um, yeah, when you measure the thickness, you're going to discover that they do not always have the same thickness. That's why you use this micrometer device to measure the exact th thickness, because the microscope objectives, and yeah, you cannot read it here. Yeah, they have uh, in most cases a number 0 0.17 written on here, and this is uh, the thickness um, that the cover glasses should have. And uh, you can buy indeed uh, cover glasses that are very precise, um, have this thickness, um, but they're quite expensive. And in most cases, when you buy uh, cover glasses, then um, yeah, there is a certain variation in thickness. And then you have, it's up to you yourself to measure out how thick it is and then kind of to, to sort it. Yeah. And uh, why is this important? Uh, because if the thickness is too far off, especially at high magnifications, um, not at the low magnifications, you don't see a difference, but at high magnifications, you can actually lose a little bit of resolution this way. Yeah, And um, I would like to show you now also something, and I'm going to uh, have to find again, where did I put the, here it is. Yeah, Here is the, the water plant again. I'm just going to show you what I'm able to do with my 60 times objective. Okay, let me go back to the scope view. So let's take this one out. Let's put the, the leaf again in here. Okay, let's have a look here. Here we go again. Okay, and uh, yeah, here we already see again uh, here on the bottom. 
uh, an oxygen bubble started to form. Okay, let's go up uh, very much with uh, the magnification. So this is um, 40 times. Ah, I'm bumping again. Insta May maybe I'm really gonna look around, look around for some kind of a, a motor drive for this. And here now, this is the 60 times. Okay, uh, look, look at the top. Okay, and let's uh, open up a little bit here. Ah, now you can actually see some of the chloroplasts moving quite nicely, right in the middle. Okay, it didn't quite move as much before. Now the stop, yeah. Do you might also see some tiny vesicles. Now I don't know to what extent you're able to see this uh, nicely. Um, yeah, in YouTube, whether the the um, yeah, I see some chloroplasts are moving, and then there are some tiny dots. These are vesicles that are moving um, as well. Um, the moving vesicles might be a, a combination of, of Brownian motion, no, maybe not so much because they are also pulled around in the cell and their uh, movement is also a little bit limited, but at least you can see the larger chloroplasts yeah, uh, moving. Uh, they would be also too large to move by Brownian motion. Okay, But actually what I wanted to show you is the following, because my... Uh, yeah, 60 times objective has a so-called uh, a, a collar, a ring over here that I can turn. And this way I'm able to adjust for different um, cover glass thickness. Okay, you can see that it becomes a little bit unsharp, or, yeah, lose uh, resolution and then, yeah. And uh, this, uh, the numbers printed on here actually tell you the, the cover glass thickness. Yeah? See the effect is a little bit here. I just wanted to demonstrate this to you that at the, these high magnifications, cover glass thickness can indeed have an impact, but probably other factors will also have a fairly large impact, like the thickness of the specimen, um, the refractive index of the mounting medium, and whatever. Right? But I just wanted to ah, there's something floating through here. Just wanted to share this uh, with you here as well that cover glass thickness does uh, play a role and the 0 0.17 that is printed on the the, um, the objective is uh, refers to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why can I not uh, see the nucleus in the cells? Okay. Uh, the nucleus in this in these cells here sometimes you can see. Uh, you have to look very carefully, but they are transparent. The chloroplasts are not transparent, they're green, <laughs> obviously, and therefore they can be seen much uh, more easily. But occasionally, I don't know, maybe, maybe look, um, let me, where's the arrow again? Could be maybe that this one over here is a nucleus. Okay, so if you are a little bit uh, careful in observing, then actually you can see them. I'm not going to use oil immersion right now, uh, but um, especially also with oil immersion microscopy, you are able to sometimes see the structures better. But then again, um, yeah, if you really want to see them well, you have to stain them. And then staining, however, um, in most cases, uh, kills the cells. Yeah, then you're not able to see the movement anymore. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a trade-off. Yeah. But indeed, um, if you sometimes look carefully, I've seen yeah, several nuclei already. So look, this one over here probably could be a nucleus. Okay. You simply have to check, yeah? And usually in cell diagrams, the nuclei are pretty big. Um, yes, because indeed it is the largest cell organelle. Um, however, as in, um, as in nature, um, there is always a variation. And uh, I think you're asking this question because you kind of were expecting the nuclei here to be bigger. Yeah. But then again, nature is very diverse, but still the nucleus is uh, yeah, the largest cell organelle. So, um, so with phase contrast, can you see it? Oh, good point. You know what? Let's try it out. So let's move this here because I'm using 60 times. Now I have to go down to, to 40 times. So I'm going, I only have a 40 times phase contrast objective. So let's go down and to 40 times. So this is now 40 times. I have to uh, put in this phase contrast, but not yet because I have to put in the phase contrast annulus. I have to open it and we have the following problem that we might be able to see it if it were not so dark. Yeah, so this is a little bit the problem. I have, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn up the thing with the camera a little bit. Yeah. So this is now how it looks in phase contrast, but I think, I see. Yeah. The magnification is not quite as, uh, quite as good. Yeah. 
It also depends quite a bit on, you know what, I'm going to take out the polarization here and it gives me a little bit more. Yes, okay, let's go down a little bit again with, it was taking away too much. So let's focus again here a little bit. Yeah, it could be, I don't know, it could be that the nucleus sometimes is covered up by the chloroplasts. I wonder, I don't know, I'd have to speculate now. I wonder if this could be one here. Yeah. Um, but I think the limiting factor here in my case is, is still that the, the magnification is not quite as high as it could be. Yeah. So that's because 40 times. You know what I could do? I could actually take a picture um, of this and then uh, digitally zoom in not able to do that now, but then maybe we're able to see a little bit the cell contents in phase contrast better. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to, I mean, I've made videos also, if you want to, I can actually show you also how to stain the nuclei of, uh, of onion cells. Works really well um, and it's quite easy to do. Yeah. So another question here, and also the central vacuole is usually very big in plant cells, but I think that the plant cells here cannot see it. Maybe it's because of the refractive index. That could be one thing. Um, number two, it could be that it is indeed there, um, but that the chloroplasts are on top and also on the bottom. Okay, so and then you don't see what's in the center. Um, and it can also be that uh, um, no, uh, sometimes um, uh, the vacuole uh, also changes in size. So for example, young cells, after division, they do not have a very large vacuole yet. So there is also some kind of a dynamic uh, thing going on here as well. Yeah? Um, I often miss the nucleus in the specimens. It's more difficult to see than you imagine due to transparency. Yes. Uh, that's that's correct. That's why um, usually um, you use uh, some some dye to stain. Methylene blue is very commonly used because it stains DNA, and of course, uh, inside the nucleus you can find uh, the DNA. Yeah. So what is what else do I wanted to show you? Oh yeah, that was the cover glass thing. Yeah. So that's so back again here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, What's your favorite plant to look at? My favorite plant, hmm. I don't know if I have a favorite plant, um, but I have to tell you that, uh, that um, especially uh, cross section of stems are quite, especially if you get some ready-made uh, specimens, I like to them a lot. Um, no, I do have a favorite plant. <laughs> Aristolochia, it's called. <laughs> it's favorite for the following reason. I don't have, nah, I could have shown you. Maybe I'm going to do a video next time where I'm going to show you some of my early pictures that I've taken. And it is my favorite plant because uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, before the time of uh, good digital cameras, I bought myself a webcam, 640 by 480 totally small uh, quality. And what I've done is, is I stitched manually stitched together using hundreds of individual pictures. I stitched together the cross section of the, of the stem. Yeah. It was, I don't know, days of work yeah? using just a, a tiny webcam that I where I took away the lens and, and I mounted it on top of, of my photo tube to directly take a picture and it actually worked. Yeah. So simply because I spent so much uh, time doing that, I think it's, uh, it, yeah, the Dutchman's pipe. That's correct. Aristolochia. That's the English uh, term is called Dutchman's pipe. Yep. Um, yes. Dutchman's pipe is the, the yeah, Aristolochia sifo it was the name of the specimen. It uh, was a, yeah, a fairly large uh, cross section of the stem. It looked really beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, this is, I, I claim this to be my favorite plant now uh, because <laughs> simply of the uh, my first, this is where I learned microscopy, so to say, yeah, um, hands on. Yeah. So um, yeah, what what else do I have? Did I already finish all of the the questions? Yeah, I finished all of the questions. So one hour and eight minutes. Is there anything else I could show you? Yes, I am going to just a second. I do have something that I want to show you. I just have to get it. Just a second. Something that I'm kind of uh, um, working on or experimenting on right now and um, is, and I need to show you, I got myself something recently um, in the desk view again. And I am going to, because I'm always looking around for connecting all the mobile phones to a camera. And I got this some time ago, but never really spent much time on, on actually testing it out. 
look at this look at this massive uh, contraption here <laughs> this is the probably the most advanced mobile phone adapter <laughs> that you can ever imagine yeah so this uh, ip is not included yeah yeah but this uh, mobile phone adapter allows you to um, and i just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit on what i'm working on right now yeah look you just put it in here yeah and yeah here is the camera and look what you're able to do by turning this you're able to adjust the distance and you're able to align the the camera by turning those two knobs yeah, yeah so this is kind of the yeah the the idea it is actually used uh, also for telescopes yeah yeah so you can um, completely perfectly align it uh, but what should I say? Uh, it does work, <laughs> but um, uh, it's by the nature of the design, of course, not a criticism, but simply by the nature of the design, it's pretty bulky. Okay, so um, and uh, I do not need one set up. I do not really need to change anything. Um, so um, yeah, it is uh, simply also by the nature. It's not quite as stable as it maybe could be, but it does work reasonably well but it simply doesn't look nice on my microscope. Yeah, it's uh, simply too bulky. Um, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, uh, aligning um, um, a mobile phone with the eyepiece is a challenge, right? Um, and uh, if you need to remove uh, the mobile phone very often, then setting it up and aligning everything again can be quite time consuming. So this actually really makes life much easier here. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, to show this to you. And the reason why I'm experimenting with this is, is because I'm not quite happy with the, uh, the image quality of the camera of my stereo microscope. And uh, the reason I'm not so happy is, is because the, it magnifies too much. So it looks a little bit blurry. And um, by connecting a mobile phone camera to the stereo microscope, I get a much larger field of view and not so much so-called empty magnification. You know, the, the microscope camera that I have, it zooms in too much. And then you can already uh, see that it's a little bit blurry. And here you don't see that so much because you're getting a much wider field of view. Yeah? So this is a little bit the thing. Um, and what I want to do um, is, is I want to, I can connect it over USB directly to the computer and I can use this also as a webcam. So this is a little bit the, the, the thing that I'm, I'm working on right now and trying to optimize this a little bit and see how well it actually uh, yeah, works. Yeah? Just wanted to, to quickly share this with you as well. Um, this is basically also quite a fascinating thing here because um, now the, yeah, the clamp is uh, really holds the eyepiece very tightly. Yeah, you cannot press this, and you have to loosen this screw here. Okay, and then you can actually release it from the eyepiece relatively easily. And this uh, plastic collar is simply there to um, yeah to make it a little bit wider. But you, so you can remove this. Yeah? There's a second one um, here as well. Yeah? So you, that's uh, simply something I just wanted to show you as well as a very interesting. Um, very interesting solution but yeah as i mentioned um, uh, fairly fairly bulky and also a slight disadvantage nothing this doesn't have to do anything with the adapter itself but there is a little bit of a tolerance between the eyepiece and the microscope as well yeah so it is not quite as stable um, as well it's, it's not a problem with, of the adapter but rather of the i have to make sure that i also get a solid connection between the eyepiece and and the microscope yeah? But it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, um, have to see how well it um, actually does uh, does work in in practice. But uh, yeah, alignment never has been so easy <laughs> as as with this one. Yeah, whether it's actually worth it or not, yeah, I cannot say yet. Yeah, but um, what I read, however, somewhere uh, also in the instruction, once it's aligned, once it is aligned, you can also, also tighten some screws to really fix it, and then everything is locked in place as well. Yeah. So I just want to go back a little bit to some of the questions and then I think I'm slowly going to call it quits for tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to read through. Yeah, um, yeah, that flower looks like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, looks like a mechanical stage. Yes, it looks like a mechanical stage. Yeah. And I was interested in how bleach worked on water with chlorophyll in it, and one drop of bleach on the cover slide was quite uh, quite a show. Ah, interesting. Never tried bleach. Yeah, I used mine for telescopes. Yes, 
Ah, okay, yes, this is actually uh, uh, Celestron. The company is actually a, a well-known manufacturer of telescopes. Same phone, but my uh, pics are not so good. What would you suggest if a first beginner camera or next trinocular microscope? Well, my suggestion is the following. Um, I, I found out that a lot uh, depends on, um, on also how... I mean, if you have a trinocular microscope one with a photo tube, then I would say that you get yourself a relatively cheap mobile phone adapter, an extra eyepiece, and that you try to first uh, get a decent picture with a mobile phone. It works surprisingly well, but it does need a lot of patience uh, for, for lining up, okay? Um, and for um, concerning the trinocular microscope, well, there's nothing I can say here. There are so many models out there, but many of them are indeed relatively similar. I would say much depends on how much you're willing to spend on the budget. Um, but I always say, uh, let's not focus too much um, on the microscope itself, but let's focus more on the things uh, that we can look at, uh, at the nature observation. And you can do quite a bit already, um, yeah, with, uh, with relatively low cost microscopes. But then of course, the more experienced you are than your own expectations also start to grow a little bit. And I have to tell you, maybe this one um, important uh, um, comment is, is because um, you are worry a little bit that your pictures are not so great then I will tell you then do the following just in a picture editing program just increase the contrast you'll be surprised how much better the images look yeah? just uh, doing a little bit. I see uh, so many pictures posted on reddit on um, online and so on and they're very low in contrast uh, but it's really only a couple of mouse clicks and you can see much better and it looks the picture just looks better yeah, so this is uh, something, yeah. And then the camera for my next uh, trinocular. Well, uh, concerning camera, there again, there are uh, different, uh, different, it's a question of taste, really. I mean, you can just show you something. If you really want convenience, a lot of convenience, you can get uh, those, uh, yeah, those microscope cameras. Uh, anything much more than five megapixels is not necessary because the microscope is limiting and there are countless cameras like these around very practical uh, because you can put them directly on a microscope but and that's a big but not so good for for actually making videos the reason is is because the usb connection is too slow in most cases it's if it's a usb 2.0 connection it's too slow um, so and i myself am also looking around i also intend to replace this here with a camera which has hdmi so with HDMI out, the resolution is much lower, but I'm getting a very, very smooth image. And then I'm using a little HDMI to USB converter, and then I can also um, basically look at it uh, on the micro uh, on, on the computer screen. Yeah. So this is uh, simply uh, something that I. But I cannot uh, recommend any specific model. There are quite a few of them out there. Many of them are relatively similar, um, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, the bigger the sensor, the better. That's also another thing that I can say. But the prices really go up very quickly. And sometimes, yeah, you can also do good stuff with, uh, like I've done, with very simple webcams. Yeah. So, yeah. But I would say if there's any recommendation, um, not more than five megapixels because it's generally not needed. And if, yeah, if you want to do video, you have to go for one with an HDMI out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I set up an okay, yes. So, uh, people, you know what I'm gonna do? One hour 17. Um, I think I'm, ooh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna call it uh, quits for today. Let me see just a second. Yeah, let's let's turn on the nice chloroplasts again here. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, I'm going to uh, call it quits uh, for today. Uh, yeah, a little bit today was a little bit different than the other streams. I have uh, covered quite a few different topics. I would like to invite you. Um, if you want uh, uh, to share some of your pictures or videos, uh, please uh, do send them to me. Um, yeah, I would like to also ask you or invite you or request. Maybe you can um, also subscribe, not necessarily only to this channel here because you probably already have subscribed, but maybe also to other um, of other people. And I generally subscribe to all of the microscopy channels that, I've, that I know about and simply to support them a little bit. 
Yeah? And uh, maybe you can uh, maybe you can do the same thing um, because the video where is this? Yeah, that's the the, the website here and, and the and the YouTube the YouTube channel. Yeah. So thank you again for for um, allowing me to use the videos here. Okay, um, people, I'm going to call it quits uh, for today. I hope to see. Can you please repeat the name of your phone adapter? Okay, the name of the phone adapter is uh, the one from. This is how it looks like. I, I got it from Amazon. Oh, it's green, so that you don't. It's called NexYZ. Can can you see this? Okay, that's how it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's uh, simply something to to try out. I have to say that uh, one of the things. Yeah, maybe that's the last comment. One of the things that I still have to do after everything is aligned up, you have to make sure that somehow it really is stable. Otherwise, it is a little bit yeah wobbly still that's simply the nature of, of, of the design because you can um, line it up in three different axes yeah yeah so i'm gonna really call it uh, uh quits now um and i wish you all the best hope to see you again next week which is the 23rd of december which is uh, yeah, just the day before christmas yeah i think uh yeah unless unless uh <laughs> something really I have a really real big time conflict. I'll make another live stream next week. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So last comment here. I have an old Swift binocular and the stage is really wiggly. Okay. Uh, what can I do? Fixing a stage is a challenge. Right. Uh, so this is uh, um, simply uh, something I can say. Um, you can try to uh, to fix it yourself a little bit and try to identify some of the screws that you might have can uh, can tighten, but um, uh, one would have to look specifically at what the problem is. But in but in any case, yeah, I can say that uh, it is possible to fix in most cases, but it might be a little bit difficult, especially if there's some kind of a ball bearing issue like I had with one of my microscopes. Yeah, but maybe it's simply nothing more than simply a screw that you have to tighten. Okay, but now I'm really going to call it quits for today. Wish you all the best. Happy micro hunting as always. Enjoy microscopy and uh, see you again next time. Bye-bye.